Okay, everybody, the word is in on the United Kingdom's research into loot boxes. One of the big things we want to know is what will they do? What will actually happen? Because we've looked at Spain. We've looked at other you know, areas in Europe. We've looked at quite a lot. And there are countries like Spain, like the Netherlands, where action is something that is seriously on the cards for this issue. Now, the UK has been calling for evidence from the public since September 2020. And with that, we're going to get some really great stats to share with you. And then, of course, because this is news, there is a bit of disappointment. So this can be broken down into three parts. Public survey, scientific analysis, and uh, and the outcomes. By the way, Matt will be back with us soon. Uh, he's currently off for a little bit. All right, the public survey. So 32,000 people. Uh, responded to this. 87% were answering as somebody who plays video games, and uh, 12% were both as a player and someone who is responsible for a child. And less than 1% were people who were only responsible for a child or a young person, but were not a player of a game. And that just shows you. That just shows you. I mean, even with that, I think there's something that we can extrapolate. Industry self-regulation is all about tools that are put in the hand of parents. Now, probably by the numbers, most parents aren't playing that many video games. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I can't be 100% sure, but that it's only 1%. I mean, that 1%, so many people who this would have been relevant to probably didn't even know about this. Now, do you think they are going to be the people who are using the parental controls, who are going to avail of the industry self-regulation whenever it comes in whatever form it comes in. I know that's not the most, like, I, I can't put any statistics to that, but I think it's certainly worth thinking about. Nearly all players who responded, 98%, had opened a loot box. 62% of eight of 16-plus uh, uh, people in the player survey responded uh, with positive uh, experiences regarding loot boxes. This is the scary thing. And these positive experiences are receiving a sought-after rare or valuable item, obtaining rewards that uh, progress your gameplay conditions and enhance the gameplay experience and enjoyment. Now, these are things that you could commonly call playing a game and actually enjoying it, getting a reward, you know, whatever, makes you happy. That's a little bit worrying. I mean, in a way, right? Because I kind of think, if I at least think about the statistics in this channel. Chances are you, like me, are between the ages of 24 and 35. Okay, so you're probably not 17, you're probably not 18, probably not 19. Of course, if you are, you're welcome. But uh, if you are a good bit younger than I am, I'm 28 now, uh, then you will have perhaps grown up in an era where loot boxes were the only thing, where they were your normal. I did not grow up in that era. I grew up before that. So I know what it felt like before all of this trash came in. Let me tell you, it felt better. You could try to find some indie games that don't have that, some other games that, that don't have that to find out for yourself, but it truly does feel better. So I wonder, as time goes on, basically, are people going to be mazed? It'll be the only thing that they know, so of course they'll have a positive experience with it. They cannot see from, you know... From, from outside what they can see in a way. They only know what, what's around them, what they've experienced, and they can't go back in time. 63% of adult respondents who opened a loot box reported the negative experiences from the use of them. 70% of respondents responsible for a child or young person had, had a negative experience. So we are actually seeing, in this case, the no's have it. And here is a breakdown of the data. So we've got ruined or uh, reduced or ruined enjoyment of a gameplay experience. 5%, 3% for players age 16 plus and a an adult who's responsible for a child. Expensive, encourage unsatisfactory purchases or are not value for money. 62%. So this pervasive thing that humongously works in the industry, 62% not particularly happy with it. And 50% if you count in adults responsible for a child. Loot boxes missold, lacked information or players experience pressure. 12% for 16 plus, 20% for the adults. And then we have caused or contributed towards financial harm or gambling related and or mental health harm. And here we got 5%, 8%, 4%, 12%. It's pretty disturbing that that number triples 
when you go into an adult responsible for a child. That's that's disturbing. Because if you take it that most children are playing video games, and if this was a representative sample, and it probably isn't, if it was nearly a representative sample, the notion that 12% of kids fall into the gambling-related or mental health harm bucket. 12%. You look at the size of an average classroom, how many people is that going to be? That's rough. And of course, we don't exactly have a rigorous study done over years here, but what happens when that person watches Trainwreck on Twitch? And yeah, they look up at the top right and it says, don't gamble, you'll you'll lose your money. But you just see Trainwreck there just doing some gamba, as they call it on that platform. I don't know. Maybe that 12% are the 12% that are more likely to fall into that bucket. And especially with stake, I mean, you know, people just go into that in a VPN. It's all running in crypto like this is not regulated. Come on. So the last two factors here, I think that's what we can call actual material harm. So eight, I mean, 8% financial harm. Okay, so, you know, if you take, uh, there's 100 people in my year at school, right? So that's eight people, eight families with financial harm. And apparently 12 with a mental health or gambling related issue. And, you know, you think about the 80-20 principle as, you know, in terms of the overall societal cost of this. I mean, do we have to talk about unpriced negative externalities? Because let's be real, the negatives that come from this, they're not paid for by the game companies who create the problem. They are paid for by society, the taxes, the national insurance that we pay. So we are footing the bill for EA to cause 8% financial harm, 12% gambling-related or mental health harm. That is brutal. Now, the self-selection of those that responded means that experiences reported in the survey are not representative of, uh, of the UK's, all UK's player you know, experiences with loot boxes, but they have nonetheless provided valuable insight. Now, of course, this is because um, the evidence gathered uh, was gathered by asking people to write in. So, what people did not write in. Yeah, I, I guess we don't know. I would say people who are generally not as informed. People who don't have the access to information. Are these numbers going to be higher for that group of people? You know, for the parent who's not clued into this? Because it was only 1% were people who were caregivers of a child who did not play games themselves. So do you think that parent who's struggling with, you know, these things with their kid, when their kid just wants to buy more loot boxes, the parent's struggling to explain to the kid what's going on, creates all sorts of strife. Do you think they're going to know to to, to talk about this? To send in their response? I don't really think so. Because when they think about gambling, they think about turning the TV on and seeing a gamble responsibly advert from Skybet. And they think that couldn't be possibly be anything to do with their child. So I worry. Now there, now there was also 50 direct submissions from interested stakeholders as well as roundtable discussions. And it's a lot. Of course, you've got the Mission and Public Affairs Council, the Church of England, as well as, of course, Activision, Blizzard, King, Yuki, which is the UK Interactive Entertainment uh, Association. We've got EA, Jagex, Ubisoft, the United States Federal Trade Commission. Huh, they were in too. As well as the likes of William Hill, literal gambling, uh, you know, a gambling company. So obviously read there, that's a company that profits from damaging and destroying society and ravaging communities. So when you think about William Hill, Paddy Power, any of these gambling companies, think of them just like you maybe think about a tobacco company. They're scum. So let's go into these findings. Many of the respondents, including the third-party organizations, contended that loot boxes should be regulated as gambling. Some respondents, in particular most industry ones, rejected these as being a form of gambling. Gee, isn't that a surprise, everyone? Other respondents then highlighted the pace of change and innovation that's saying that could result in new products with similar risks being made quickly available to circumvent uh, whatever the new definitions of gambling are. And that's the tricky thing, because you either target the broad issue 
with maybe legislation that's just too too broad for purpose, or you go so specific that you can only nail a certain number of things to the wall, and then the game industry just changes around it. Now, they say then that whilst, you know, there's all the data limitations, etc., uh, stuff does suggest that a small minority of players could spend disproportionately high amounts on purchasing loot boxes relative to other players. Yes, it's called whaling, we've all known about that. Uh, so, one considered by in-game found that the top 5% of loot box spenders generated half the total expenditure on loot boxes, with no evidence that this 5% had greater income than others. I mean, that latter part is quite interesting, and it's like, okay, we're talking about small minorities. Oh, financial harm, players 16 plus 5%. Gosh, isn't that interesting? When you get the kids in the mix, it's 8%. Hmm. Wow, very, very cool numbers. Very cool. I feel great about the game industry sometimes. Nearly all submissions that responded to the question from third sector, parliamentary, and professional medical groups contend that children and young people were at more risk of being negatively impacted by loot boxes as compared to adults, and we do indeed see that uh, borne out in a bunch of the data. Some game industry respondents, though, talk about there being a lack of evidence on how loot boxes are causing harm for children, young people, and adults, and they're also highlighting measures developed by the industry, you know, the parental controls, all that stuff, that obviously, you know, don't really work. Now, for the scientific data that was a part of this. So, the UK government uh, basically commissioned a study of the available science on loot boxes, right? This was supposed to be, you know, info from peer-reviewed sources to really find the facts. This happened between February and March 2021, and the core question was, do the loot boxes encourage problematic play behaviors? And it basically was jumping into uh, nationally and internationally, what are the key characteristics of these loot boxes? And do they actually have the potential for problematic pay, uh, play? Right, so when we go to the first one, they say that they are a convergence of user retention strategies and data analytics with random reward mechanics, which have long been part of game design. And what's fascinating is something that really makes me want to draw to your attention the previous video we did in this channel about Unity, uh, John Riccatello, and Ironside, or Iron Source. It was about monetization in games, and I think this is basically what's here in the report shows, shows us something. Because it's basically saying that monetization can sometimes be a downstream consideration in free-to-play games, uh, right? But then it says, however, the use of sticky design techniques and the randomization of rewards combined with the microtransactions has led to comparisons to gambling. Basically, whenever Riccatello is talking about, you know, the game developers are, you know, fucking idiots for not considering monetization from the get-go, it's like, you, you know, ultimately you extrapolate that and you essentially get this and that's not good for us. Now then what we really want to know is what's the damage being done? How is this causing problems? So we've got 15 studies which empirically correlated loot box use with problem gambling. Okay, well, I guess uh, that's great for the industry arguments that say that there's not enough research. These studies showed a stable and consistent association between loot box use and problem gambling. Gosh, there's also emerging evidence of a dose-response relationship. So the more money you spend, the greater the problem your gambling severity is. And then, I mean, certainly what happens when you look at streamers who are, you know, they're blowing 50 grand a spin at stake, 75 grand a spin and double rainbow or any of that other ghastly shite that I've had to look through for research and videos. However, this empirical work is emerging and has tended to concentrate on replicating findings rather than exploring and understanding the drivers of the association. So that basically means they, they, they kind of know what's going on, but the actual psychological drivers, it would be good to know more. Now, they do say, though, that while that is like empirically what they found, there are a range of different things that could underpin this association between the loot boxes and the gambling. So basically, what parts of the human psychology are being played on? How do those work? And continuing on, they found uh, only two studies um, that basically took into account a range of other measures. And one found that broader gambling behaviors explained the relationship between loot box purchasing and problem gambling right? And then one found that relationship uh, persistent even after broader gambling and impulsivity were taken into account. So basically, it is an emerging field, but it's becoming quite clear that there is some form of association. And of course, there's other harms as well. I mean, yes, the association is a problem gambling, but also well-being, anxiety, and depression. When you're anxious and depressed, I mean, you just want the next hit. We've all been there. We've all eaten the Doritos, the Chuba Pringles. That's one like maladaptive thing that maybe we're anxious or depressed. 
For some people, it's pull the lever. Get a new loot box. Okay, so findings and recommendations. What could be done? So they identified there was a pattern of research showing a correlation between the loot box usage and the problem gambling. But this has not been shown to be a causal link and the directionality is not clear. So it's like they're just struggling to put it together. It's the sort of thing, like to you and me, it could just make intuitive sense what's going on. But I think with the level of rigor that they would actually want, they they, they kind of do want to, to know more. Uh, but certainly even that... We already know there's a large enough slice of society who do have an issue with problem gambling. So if there's a crossover where if you show those people loot boxes and they go into loot boxes, I mean, damn. Whenever the psychological conditions that lead to problem gambling uh, happen with gambling, we regulate it with when it doesn't happen in, in literal gambling, like for real money, but it happens in a loot box, we don't regulate it. I suppose, I don't know, that's interesting. Hmm. Now, the definition and study of loot boxes and uh, RRM, random reward mechanics, has been underdeveloped, and they advocate for a cautious approach, but one that does take some form of uh, action against loot boxes, particularly under a consumer pr uh, protection framework, with this starting with guidelines and having the option for further action if data shows harmful effects. And then after that, they basically talk about a sort of like uh, how to make an ethical loot box. So, hey everyone, let's build an ethical loot box together. Won't that be fun? So a minimum age informed by the science. Uh, players informed via on-screen message when sudden spikes in spending activity occur, just in case they weren't aware. Games that are involving loot boxes clearly and unambiguously inform players that loot boxes involving microtransactions are included in the game but are not essential requirements for playing these games. Players may decline to use them without penalty. All right. <laughs> As they would say, and it's always sunny, nice one, science bitches. Uh, that's not going to work. Players may decline w without a penalty. I mean, there so many games, there will be a penalty. I mean, like, what do you think of a Diablo, a Diablo Immortal? Does a crest count as a loot box? Because you don't literally open the crest. No, the crest just powers up the reward from a greater rift. Or whatever, the, you know, the crest rifts. I wonder how that would count. Hmm. People should be advised to take regular breaks. Yeah, I'm sure that'll work. Devs and publishers should operate generous refund policies. And as, as an example, all spend in the last X days. And people should have a clear path to obtain that and to self-exclude. <laughs> That's so naive. Oh no, I didn't get an 18-star Diamond Ronaldo. I want a refund now. How do you deal with that? It should be clear at the point of purchase that they do not guarantee a direct path to success in a game. Hmm. Oh, I wonder what that means for your pity system. A direct path to a five-star character. Loot boxes are prominently labeled with uh, content ranges and percentage chances clearly displayed. Uh, well, what happens if that's uh, dynamic? Is, is, it, is it legal for that to be dynamic? How does that actually work? Um, people access a tally of recent uh, spend and user's profile to let people make more informed decisions about their spending. I'm sure there's some research that helps with problem gambling, but problem gambling is still a pretty damn massive problem, isn't it? Hmm. Players should view estimated average spend amounts to level up or max out a character. Ho, oh, oh. ho. Basically, that's the mask off rule, right? To max out a character. Could you imagine if Blizzard Entertainment were forced to put that in Immortal? Can you imagine? Would that not be an awesome law or an awesome regulation just for the sheer lulls of it? Uh, right, here's another one. Contents or chances not predetermined or targeted based on player behavior. So basically, don't fiddle around with the numbers behind the scenes to further optimize your, uh, your good old money funnel. After a set number of purchases, you're informed that this is their fourth, eighth, etc. purchase. I mean, if, if that's an opt-in, why would they do that? Game companies should ensure their likely first por uh, point of contact with players experiencing distress, uh, etc. are appropriately trained to offer support and as informed uh, you know, as, as they are for possible methods to redress or, or, or refund. Really? Is that going to happen? Is that going to happen? And also what happens if, you know, you, you, you spend a whole bunch of money 
and you don't get the thing that you want. You don't get your, I don't know, very powerful Ronaldo. For, <laughs> it's like I only know five footballers in my head or for FIFA, right? And then it's like, okay, I want a refund. But they say, well, it's against our policy to issue a refund because you didn't like what you got in the box. I mean, could they just not use that defense all the time? What What is like, what's the burden of proof there? Is it like that you bought a bunch of loot boxes and you got the Ronaldo, but then you realized it was a, a mistake and because you got something good out of the box, and, and, oh, well, that shows genuine remorse, doesn't it? I don't know. Policies. The policies there could be quite weird, uh, especially when it's so clear of the extremely limited value uh, that, that is offered. And the problem here is that this ain't law. This is just best practice, right? So... Are game companies going to adopt best practice from science people when it's against their own interests? No. What happens if EA does something that makes their ultimate team revenue go down? Investors see, oh, the most important single segment of this company's revenue is down. The stock is a sell, not a buy. That's what happens. Want to piss off JP Morgan? Right? You want their analysts? to issue a, a lower stock target? Have people sell your stock? Do you really want that? They're not going to do that. It doesn't work like that. This is, I don't know, so it's all this self-regulation stuff is just, it's just naive. For their conclusion then, loot boxes have been linked to a variety of harms, including robust evidence of a problem gambling, uh, you know, a problem gambling occurring, but the causal relationship has not yet been identified. So they know, you know, that they know that there's the link, but science still needs to find the causal relationship. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure it's the sort of thing we can all intuit, but you know, they're they're going to want a peer-reviewed uh, you know study where they can really pin it down. Children are more susceptible from harm because of their inherent vulnerabilities. All right, the less developed impulse control. Did you know the male brain's not fully developed until it's 25? Well, that was kind of interesting. That's the fun little stat I uh, found out recently. And again, you look here. Oh, the mental health issues, 12%. And you know what happens when you're, you're giving mental health issues to kids and, you know, you're causing more family strife? Oh, actually, that's in their formative years. That can actually change who they are, right? So that's not good. That's not good at all. So what's the UK government doing now that they have uh, some pretty clear information about the, you know, maybe the causal relationship ain't there, but we know the clear link? Well... The government's view is that purchase should be unavailable to all children and young people unless enabled by a parent or guardian. Now, this is extremely important. Some people had a bit of a laugh whenever we brought up organ donation, but we brought it up because of the default effect, right? So if organ donation in your country is opt-in, then you get numbers of like, you know, 88, 90% of people who are in for the organ donation because they think, well, if I die and my liver can save that person, uh, well, that's surely good. I'm not needing the damn thing anyway. I'm dead. Now, there are other countries, like the United States, where it's opt-in. So you're opted out by default, and their rates are way, way, way lower. And then you think, wow, I mean, imagine if they made it opt-in. Imagine how many more lives would be saved. And it's just because deviating from the default just takes effort, and we're all really busy. And also, we don't generally plan to not need our organs. <laughs> kind of, you know, we plan to use them for a while. So... That's why this, if it was by law, something that had to be enabled by a parent, that would be good. But that said, kids are crafty. I mean, there was not shit my parents could do to circumvent anything I wanted to do in the internet, that's for sure. And I'm sure it was the same for you growing up. I mean, I had a second router for whenever the, you know, the, the was turned off. I had no idea. I still don't know. Maybe I should tell them. They also say that all players, including the kids, young people, and adults, should have access to spending controls. I don't like the idea that a seven-year-old, uh, we're talking about maybe a seven-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old, spending controls in a game. And I know, they're young people. They're eventually going to have to be adults and, and all of that. But uh, I don't know. I just think it's a little bit ghastly that we're kind of, I mean, hey, we talk about the monetization of, of young people. We get into a whole place, don't we? But they would prefer an industry-led approach. Now, who knows? Uh, obviously, uh, this is all done under a conservative government. Uh, maybe if there was a labor government, maybe they would have a different uh, approach because, of course, you know, labor, they're going to be a little bit more pro-regulation. 
conservatives, they're going to be a bit less pro-regulation, uh, right? I suppose similar enough to the Republicans and the Democrats in the States. You know, one side likes regulation more than the other. Uh, it is what it is. We can all have our opinions on that. That's fine. But evidently, the industry-led approach is going to be, I think, the default for, um, you know, for, for more like economically conservative uh, party. So that would just mean developers have got to build all this stuff. You know, they have to build it themselves. They have to self-police. And there you go. And I suppose the thought is that the developers take a principled first approach that would avoid cumbersome legislation where possible. And I think we could all agree that if the industry could self-regulate, then sure, we wouldn't have to get government involved. It would all be a lot more efficient, simple, fast, nimble, agile, etc. But is that going to happen? I really don't think so. So then, two initiatives. The Department for Culture, Media, and Sport will be convening a technical working group uh, to broaden future research on the industry by standardizing methodologies and data collection between the industry and academia with the following incisive topics. How and why people play games, how and why games are designed different ways, and the effectiveness of the measures put in place to reduce the risks. Are you falling asleep? Yeah, I kind of am too. Uh, you know, if you've ever watched the television show, Yes, Minister, this all just sounds like Sir Humphrey stuff. Just, it's just a delaying tactic. It may as well be that. There you go, because any delay is, of course, playing into the hands of the incumbents. So why is the UK not going to do anything meaningful about this? And you might say, oh, the UK is just one little country. It doesn't really matter. Well, I mean, for EA and FIFA, like football, pretty damn big here, all right? So it's a, it's a big enough industry. So what are, what are the reasons? Well, they will not treat it as gambling. They won't do it because you cannot cash out. Though the Gambling Commission can actually make a call as to whether it is, if there is a way where like items could retain value outside of a game. But fundamentally, they are still doing that. They're also talking about the risk of legislation being too narrow or too broad. Both of those are problems, I suppose. You want to make it decently crafted because is suddenly your wine of the month a loot box? Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That's a tricky little thing. You know, when I, I had a little beer box that came whenever I liked craft beer. And uh, I kind of liked the idea of there being a themed box of beer arriving every month, uh, themed after a different country. I would find value in not picking the beer because in a way I had hired beer pickers to do it for me. And I get a box of something that I would like. And I feel like as an adult, it should be my right to do that. But then... What happens, I mean, in, in my instance, it was a company called Beer 52, and one of the reasons why I decided to cancel that, other than, you know, actually stopping drinking alcohol, that was one of them, uh, but it was actually how aggressive their marketing was to the point where I no longer really felt uh, like it was ethically okay to continue supporting that company because of how just fucking egregious they were, uh, you know, with their marketing, how annoying it was. Um, I mean, they, they actually called me up after I canceled, and your man was... I, I literally said the first time, no, I don't drink alcohol anymore, bye. Like, I, I don't want this. And it's just the amount of time it took to get him off the phone. I mean, I was nearly at the point of just being like, would you fuck up and hit, you know, hit the hang up button? Maybe I should have done that. Maybe I should have done that because certainly, <laughs> well, yeah, it was pretty insane when it happened. Let's just say that. But is that not an interesting, I mean, to hop into the perspective of a legislator? Is that not an interesting little quandary? What do you think about that? Let me know down below. I mean, is a physical loot box different to a digital loot box? What about uh, magic cards? What about football cards? Which, of course, FIFA Ultimate Team is modeled off. Interesting. They also say that it would increase the remit of the Gambling Commission too much and double their operating costs. Well, there you go. So I suppose they want to keep those costs down. Um, the potential revenue created through attacks on loot boxes and gambling products would also require changes to the state tax apparatus, as these would not align, and companies would simply not sell their uh, games uh, in the UK, where they feature loot boxes, as they've done elsewhere, which would lessen uh, the return on investment from any changes made. So yeah, it's like, okay, the UK is going to tax loot boxes, because if... Tobacco is causing a massive in, uh, you know, problem in, in, your, in your country. Just make a lot of money off it instead. Yes. <sighs> I mean, would EA pull out? Beef Ultimate Theme is pretty damn big here. I know that for a fact. Also, unintended consequences. For an example, the legislation uh, you know, to introduce an outright ban on children and young people purchasing loot boxes could have the unintended effect of more children and young people using adult accounts. True. 
True. My parents said, you know, if that, that came in, I would get around it easily. And then you say, ah, how about you make it so you cannot get around it? And then I say, hello, take a look at China. Take a look at the, you know, the biometric stuff that's going on to do age identification in order to enforce the uh, the state rules on how long you can play a video game and uh, at what days of the week you can play a video game. So that's something. What's the industry going to do? Well, Yuki say they're leading the way. Uh, wow. So they... I mean, this is shocking, everyone. They're going to increase awareness of spending controls and responsible play through three through a three-year, one million pound public information campaign. One million pounds. Now, the Association for the UK Interactive Entertainment (UK) 2022 market valuation report estimates that the UK consumer games market reached a record figure of 7.16 billion in 2021. Hmm. There you go, one million. One million. I'm sure that will penetrate absolutely fucking nowhere. And the industry has also been set some expectations by the government. So perhaps if they fall foul of these, something could happen. Because as much as that's just say, you know, a conservative government continues, maybe they are the party. I mean, they did try a whole ban thing on porn. I believe it was like face sitting was apparently not okay. So, um, <laughs> I mean... I remember that came in and uh, it was, I was someone I knew were like, okay, cool. That's like, uh, I mean, lesbians, we love this shit. What? You're, you're going to ban that? Excuse me? Hello? So I suppose it was just quite funny that they were almost putting in some sort of like, uh, I don't know, weird, heteronormative, bizarre thing on porn. And I just say that to, uh, to highlight that uh, that party is certainly one that can actually fall to a little bit of the old moral panic. We can't be having videos of ladies sitting on top of uh, each other's faces on the internet. Think of the children. Literally that, sometimes, actually. So developers and publishers uh, will be expected to support age-appropriate design decisions, including, uh, you know, protecting kids from loot boxes, doing all that stuff, and this would likely involve the implementation of age assurance technologies. What's that? I don't know. I mean, you're going to have to, uh, you know, do the thing where you scan your passport. You take a selfie, it goes off to the big, I don't know, the, the big place far away where the data is. So I hope the data protection stuff's there is, is great. Uh, information in loot boxes must be transparent, balanced, and accessible. In addition, uh, this should uh, set out risk associated as well as, you know, tools and controls that can be used to mitigate those risks. And also a lenient approach to refunds is expected where people have put themselves at the risk of financial harm in spite of any of the mitigating effects. I don't think any of this shit's going to work. I don't think it's going to work. Do you? Right? The very least you made it this far, you owe me one thing. Either yes or no. And I know that saying yes is asking one more letter out of your keyboard, but please, do you think any of this could be meaningfully effective? Yes or no? Let me know in the comments down below. And I mean, hey, if you put that there, then maybe, yeah, I don't know, you reach the end of the video. But I would like to know what you think. Because I always have this struggle when I think about stories like this, because at, at the one, you know, there's one part in, in in my in my heart that's like, ah, no, I'm an optimist. You know, fuck all the regulation. Let's just do it right. And then there's the version of me that's like pragmatic and lives in the real world and is like, ah, yes, oh, mm. yeah, but they're not going to self-regulate, are they? So honestly, for me, it's a no. I want to know what your answer is. Let me know down below. That's it for today's video. See you next time.